She's really the, ah, she's so stinking. This meeting is being recorded. Oh, all righty. Hmm. Um, I guess I push, got it. Um, anyway, welcome Victoria and thanks for helping me on this. Um, started this she is she had the the, the blacksmith radio and uh blacksmith academy and stuff like that she was kind of ahead of her time in the the zoom uh areas so way to go victoria thank you uh and then i want to introduce jake come on board jake um hey. nice to uh, nice all right buddy here yeah, so Jake, uh, well, I've known Jake for a long time, and I know that he's just passionate about his design. Um, I remember uh, first time I met Jake was at a Western States conference in, oh, uh, it was uh, Mount Hood, mm -hmm. and we we all had teams. It was called, It was the Blacksmith Wars. And I had my my team, and you're supposed to show up with a drawing and stuff like that. His team did not show up with a drawing. They just showed up and drew it on the pavement right then. They got, you know, they got, you know, checkmarked off on uh, not having a drawing. But uh, that's the first time I met Jake. And we had a great time because we were sharing, sharing tools and sharing laughs and all that good stuff. So um, anyway, well, welcome, Jake. Uh, appreciate you being here. And uh, I guess I have, uh, I've worked with you twice, once in Sacramento and once in Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we'll get to, um, I'm gonna work with you again in yep. Vista. So we'll get to that at the end. So, all right. Uh, any other business we got to take care of? I would just say in this, if anyone has a question at any point, please jump in, shoot a message into the chat and, uh, and the admins here will, will field the question to me, but please don't feel like uh, you can't interrupt. I really, uh, you know, you've just signed up for like two hours of listening to me drone on. So, you might want to break it up with some some back and forth a little bit. So yeah, if you have a question, any any ideas, you know, process, thoughts on design, whatever it is, you know, just just jump on in, throw it in the chat, and one of these one of these guys will will, will hurl it at me. Um, other than that, I mean, thanks for the invite to do this. Obviously, this is all tied in with with the conference demonstration coming up here in what, April. Um, bit of a prelim for that. So yeah, I'm just really excited to do this present some of the ideas and uh, yeah. we're ready. I, I'll it's just, exciting. Uh, I yeah, it's exciting. Just, just to be clear, if I leave my little face chat icon things here, do you, you guys all see that on your screen or should I minimize it? What do you mean, Jake? Like the, the little the little picture of all the, you know, all the little faces. <laughs> Oh you, yeah, you got, no, that's only your view. It is okay, perfect. Okay, I, I am technologically semi-able. <laughs> um, I did make we my own PowerPoint. We okay, got awesome. you. Do this. Let's do this. All right. So uh, if we're all sitting comfortably, I will begin. Um, uh, so this is design tools on design. I made my very own PowerPoint thing with slides and everything. So that's like a whole step up for me. Um, I'm going to break the talk down into a few sections. Um, I'm going to start with a real run through my approach to sculpture, uh, mainly because whenever I look at anyone else's website, I pretty much completely ignore their architectural work and go straight to sculpture because I figure, certainly in, in my experience, sculpture is where your individuality is going to express itself the strongest and it's going to give you the, the closest um, view into that particular blacksmith, that particular artist's kind of real um, their vision, their soul, that's where they're at. Architectural work, it's all client-based, it's site-specific, it's code meeting, it's all, all the requirements, it's 
you know, there's so many impacts on your design when you're doing architectural work that you often are tempering out your sculptural instincts, budget, all the things. We'll get to that. But um, I want to I want to focus really on, on sculptural work. And then I will shift a little bit to how I bring my sculptural um, sort of flavor in, into my architectural projects where I can. And then at the end, we'll have a little bit of a, a back and forth about the design coming up for, for Vista here. So this first image, just a title image, but it really could be my entire slideshow. Um, it's a shape that I use an awful lot. Uh, but it's to me, it's kind of encapsulates everything that I need to present to a client or a buyer or whoever else it is about blacksmithing, about forging. It's the expression of the material moving. It is texture that is generated as a process of creating the form. It is imperfection whilst being in some ways perfect. I think the imperfection creates the sense of perfection. That's just my own take. I mean, there is no perfect. Um, in fact, my little logo you see in top left there, there's two J's, which is obviously my name. It's two hammers, but it's also the pi symbol, but broken because I will never achieve mathematical perfection in my work and I don't really choose to chase it. Um, and also in this image, the material's hot. And that's really for me where it's at. It's, it's a weird thing to present to your clients the finished material because everything about how I interact with the material is when it is hot. That's when it comes alive. That's when it is reacting to the processes that I am imparting onto it. And yet I have to present a cold <laughs> finished item to, to a client. So I, I try and keep as much of the story of what I do to the material in the material once it leaves my shop. So, so that's kind of an overview of, of my process. We're only on slide one. This is going to be a long night. So um, sculptural forms. There is a very literal translation of, of this shape, and, and I can claim no originality to this shape in, in, in any way. The circle is not mine. The way the circle is forged by Fuller and the edges is not mine. But no, no, no originality in technical um, procedure here. Composition, I, this is mine. Um, and this is something I've done quite a bit. It's it's a very, it's taking a shape, it's, it's design informed by process, a shape that I love forging. How can I make it into something that I think will appeal to someone who is not a blacksmith and doesn't necessarily get the same kick off of forged material that I do. So I, you know, I've grown up on the west coast of various countries. I grew up in Cornwall, England, and I live on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Lots of sunsets, lots of surfing, lots of horizons. So I naturally gravitated to creating these two-dimensional sculptures, relatively two-dimensional sculptures that are horizon-based, you know, various um, takes on sunsets and, and surf and sea. But you've got, you know, continual movement in the piece, some simple lines. Um, this piece is not particularly interesting. It's just my, my intro piece, but it's just showing how you can take a form that you like and apply it into a slightly different situation. And everyone is going to obviously find a different form that really, really floats their boat. Um, let me move this out of my own way. I can't just hang on a minute. There we go. That's better. Um, playing with a the landscape theme. Um, but moving away from really more abstract imagery into slightly more representational stuff. This was my first uh, visit down to California in Dave Carroll will be able to tell me sometime a few years ago at Vista. Um, and this is bringing <clears throat> into sculpture something that I think is very important when making art personally is to bring in a sense of narrative, whether you're tying that to a place or whether you're actually telling a, a story with your work. This is my trip down from Vancouver Island through California. Um, so you know, we're passing by the Sierra Mountains, Sierra Nevadas, and you know, passing by the big cities of LA and the, the Baywatch beach houses, getting into the, the rolling surf of Southern California and the sun setting behind that great ocean. Um, you know, so a lot of a lot of narrative, a lot of um, tying image to a place, 
you know, I think it's it maybe wouldn't be a very good sculpture hanging on a wall in Maine, for example, but it would look great hanging above a fireplace in in you know, Monterey or something. Um, but you know, tying into that a lot of the shapes and, and the flavors that I like to use, lots of texture again, you know, using texture and generating form, um, lots of heavy forging, lots of joinery, and, and you know, peculiar use of joinery and, and trying to make things a little bit, you know, unnecessarily complicated. I think that's part of being a blacksmith. Um, and questions Jake, can you point? give us a, a sense of how big that is? Oh, you know, how big the rivets this are is, and how oh, this one's probably five feet across this was my i think it was one of my first collaborative sculptures that, and dave, dave carroll invite invited me down to vista and i designed this thing and then i got down there and i was like wow it's gonna be really complicated and, and big <laughs> i'm not gonna be able to do it by myself and so we just pulled a whole bunch of people off the bleachers we had uh, john mcclellan was down there and oh. uh tim uh Toby Hickman jumped up off the benches and oh. we had a whole, we had, I can't remember who all was on it, but we had a whole bunch of people. It was, it was really good fun. Um, but that was kind of the start of, of doing these live collaborative pieces for me. Um, yeah. So cool. What year was that? Those. Sorry. Did uh, I? That would have 2000 something. something. My, uh, my young, my, was, or 2011. Yeah. My youngest was still really small and she's just turned 14. So it was, it was a while back. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we do hope to have that on display at the conference. All right, on exactly. Cool. It'd be nice, nice to see it again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, and uh, you know, it's a nice blend of, for me anyway, you know, bringing in as much technical work as I can, rivets and punching and and all of the joinery into a piece that is is more sculptural, where it can be easier to walk away from the technique. Um, and again, here playing with. Um, sense of place in a sculpture and, and very this this is a sculpture i did for the airport in toronto it's a nine foot tall sculpture of, of the skylines of toronto it's called skylines um, and it's a weird thing playing with the cityscape because you have these incredibly rigid you know rigid structures the city is a very static i mean some might argue that, that, that the city is a very uh, living thing but it's visual perspective is incredibly static it is a it is a, a, a place of mass so, you know it kind of lends itself to steel so Christ. we got into we got into this sculpture tell you here. this is what it is if you want it sorry what's that did some somebody have a comment i thought i heard a comment but maybe not i'll just carry on shall i um so we you know we the, the solidity of a building, you know, creating that sculpturally kind of leads quite nicely into metal. It's, it's a big solid material. So, you know, the city part of Toronto, the CN Tower, the Rogers Centre, two iconic kind of uh, you know, buildings in Toronto, pretty solid. They're pretty chunky. Um, but then we get into, we've got a moon here, the shape, you know, again, getting into that that forged circle um, with, the, with the kind of, you know, when you see that moon, you know, when it kind of blew, glows through a nice sort of light evening cloud. You get that kind of halo aiming to, to do that. So we're softening up that, that heaviness of the city already. And then uh, Toronto obviously situated on the on the shores of a big lake. I'm not gonna name it because I'll get it wrong. But um, so there's the CN Tower reflected in the moonlight in the ripples of a lake. Um, so bringing in, you know, that, that, that sense of movement. And that's something that I find is very important me in in the work is you know we we forge this living moving material i like to 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 create that in my in my work that sense of movement um and you know anyone that's looked into a into a rippled puddle of a moonlit night is going to recognize that shape i think pretty pretty easily for what it is um but it's it's interesting oh, sorry that's my oven beeping in the background hey maya excuse me a minute maya is um, I think it's really easy when you're trying to make a, a shape that you want to appear to be still moving to get locked into this, how do I even phrase this, to, to, to create something that you think looks like it's moving but feels static. Um, and I see that a lot in, in work where you know the, the intent is to create a sense of movement but it's somehow lost in translation which is 
you know, I think it's easy to do, right? To lose that, it, it is a hard material. But I think you know, when I'm when I'm when I'm designing, I try to I try to create the feeling that the end of the sculpture is not the end, you know, so that any any of these terminal points could continue on indefinitely. That horizon line there. So can you see my cursor? You know, in, yes. In, in, in the reflection, that horizon line could stretch out into infinity. And and these moon these moon ripples with the way they're pulled away, again, they imply movement outside of where they're actually forged to. Same with the spirals down here. Um, and that's you know, I, I try to capture that. I, I like to think I'm effective in it. Um, but you know, I want I want the eye to travel outside of the sculpture and the mind to fill in the blanks. You know, it's it's pretty standard kind of uh, abstract artistic kind of approach but it's it's fun to do it in something as, as solid as steel um again tying sculptures to place and you know bringing bringing this idea of narrative in, into a sculpture telling a story as you go um yes that one is it yes um this was forged for the Center for Metal Arts when they were still up in Florida, New York, which uh, the Hudson Valley is famous for, for black dirt farming, really, really rich soil up there, and they grow a lot of onions. So we've, we designed a sculpture um, of a resting farmer, you know, hard day's work resting on a shovel in front of a field of, of you know, rows of onions. Very site specific. It, it makes that makes to anyone the farms it makes sense but it's it was you know, designed very much tied into a specific geographical location but you know bringing in all those all the shapes and flavors that that for me are what make forging really exciting really you know allowing the plasticity of the material to to generate these shapes and trying not to contain it too much um and when i'm doing these collaborative pieces too like i, I will design a thing on a piece of paper and I'll have an idea how I would make the shape and approach it in my shop with my tooling and equipment. And then I'm handing it off to a bunch of people that have never forged like this before often uh, and say, okay, well, here's how I think I will do it. Here's the shape. Let's see what we can, um, let's see what we can generate. So everything comes out a little different and, and often a little more interesting than I had designed it because they're taking, you know, they're making an interpretation of my, my style. Um, so I, I really enjoy this process of working collaboratively. Is it really okay. Jake, are yes. the upper portions of this um representative of clouds or is it more it's, a tree it's thing? Sort of clouds, it's a sort of tree. It's 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 you know, it is not so representational as to say that I'm dictating what the forms must be. I mean, I it's sort of obvious what it is, but yeah, that could be I mean they're really cloud forms, but they are coming off a tree. So um I'll leave that open to interpretation, I think. But you know, lots of use of of, of uh, you know using the mass of the material um, rather than using you know a line to define uh, the design and, and 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 drawing it very obviously. You use that you know, use the mass inherent in the material to 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 create the create the shape and then create the story that you want to tell. Um, and adding layers of complexity and, and narrative into again a landscape sculpture. This was my most recent one down for Center for Metal Arts in uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania. So anyone that's been there will probably recognize the the Octagon Forging Building. You know, this is such an iconic space for blacksmithing. Um, I work quite hard with PQ to, to 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 come up with something here that would really capture the essence of Johnstown, Pennsylvania. So we have. Uh, the old bridge that stopped the flood, uh, the, the 1899 flood that destroyed Johnstown was 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 um, basically blocked by a stone bridge that is just up river of the octagon. Um, stopped the debris and it's about the only reason the octagon is still standing. You know, the big 3000 power hammer, 3000 pound Chambersburg, the footbridge that every single worker at the Cambria Ironworks had to cross every day across the river. To get to the works, and then there's you know the representation of, of uh, Patrick and myself as the, the new workers in the in the, in the CMA. Um, so, Jake, did you did you guys design this on site, or did you have an no, idea this, what you were this, doing? This this one I designed ahead of time. Um, I okay. talked with 
I talked with PQ a little bit about about the design and uh, what I what I was hoping to achieve, and and you know I asked him if there was anything he particularly wanted to see in the sculpture. As you know, as the director of CMA, he's obviously you know, very emotionally attached to the place. Um, sure. So we you know, had a little bit of back and forth on, on the design. I, I you know I had pretty much free range on it. Um, and but again, trying to try and tie in you know some of the things you know people are coming a, a long way uh, often to come and work with me. So trying to tie in some shapes that uh, people would consider. Oh, if I come to a, you know do a workshop with Jake, I'm going to want to try these shapes. But you know adding some things that not necessarily usual in my in my approach, which is fun for me to try something new. Um, so that's the uh, that's the execution of that piece. It's thirteen feet wide. I think we ended up being so it was a big one. Um, and you know, lots of use of you know some cunning two dimensional fake three Ding. You know, the hammer's all just made out of plate, but a lot of fun. Wow! How many people? I think there was eight of us plus. Okay. Now we had one drop out. Yeah, about eight of us. Yeah, yeah. Mm. I had to work really hard on this one, which was a bit unusual. <laughs> Usually I just get the point and stick and everyone else does the work. But this one was mm -hmm. nice. and everything. Shocking. But, uh, yeah. Mm. Um, and, and no other questions at this point? You're all happy with the sound of my voice? My dulcet much, tones are soothing you? How much time <laughs> did you have put into this particular piece? It was 13 feet long and uh, was it over a week? It was five days, um, and some of them were quite long. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, man hours, I didn't, I didn't count, but a lot. Yeah. This seems very much like your drawing. Is there a little bit? Is there some fluidity as pieces are coming together? Does it get more um, refined? In the yeah, process? Oh, that's interesting. So, I've run into this. Um, a couple of people have asked me, "Well, how how do you how do you manage you, these workshops?" Because you know, you, you you are having to allow people to interpret your drawing. But yes, yeah, so that's the drawing. We we hit it really close. There were some things I held them really tight to. The building, because it was, um, you know, it's a pretty, sorry, hiccups. It's a pretty solid representation of the space. You know, we kept that to fairly tight dimensions, but, you know, it was all forged. These are all forged plates and lapped, and, you know, these are all punched in. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to hold them to the millimeter on a design like this, but I've got to, I've got to keep a reasonably close tolerance, but then I have room in places like, you know, these, these swoops, I, I couldn't tell you, I've never, I, we didn't scale them off and damn, they got them really close, but, um, you know, I, I'm going to give people an approximate measurement. Um, and then we'll arrange the pieces to fit based on how the material reacts at the time. Because generally we haven't we haven't got time to redo pieces. You know, it's a, you've got one shot at this. So you forge it out and I'll figure out how we can make it work in the piece. You know, sometimes I might have to come in and do a bit of tweaking, but um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely room for freedom, but I can't give complete freedom because then you end up with absolute chaos and you know, nothing fitting together at the end of the week, which is, Pretty, pretty key, isn't it? So that's that one. Let's see what do we get to next. Okay, so this is you know coming full circle with the circle, I suppose, in a sculptural sense, with a completely abstract sculpture, um, which is something I've really moved away from. Just you know pure abstract shapes. I think partly because I find them, I don't find them that satisfying. You know, without the without the narrative behind it, for me it it loses its appeal. But this is a piece. I did for the blacksmith shop. Joe Coaches bought this one from me, um, and it's just a representation of everything I love about forging. You know, you've got the transition from one shape of these two and a half inch square, the transition from stock material into something completely and utterly different, and you know, introducing from square this incredible plasticity and, and freedom of movement that is, you know, open to us as blacksmiths when we have this material. Up at a screaming, you know, screaming high heat, and we've got the right equipment to move it. It's, 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 it's such an, a freeing material to work. Um, so this is, yeah, it's it is a blacksmith sculpture for blacksmiths. Um, but what's, this, that, what's that, the scale of this? Um, 
you guys see my hands here? I'm just trying to figure probably just over a foot across, maybe 16 inches across, I think. It's been a long time since I've seen it in person. You know, that was, that was forged using, I think I was using inch, one inch fullers under my power hammer on that. And I really, really just letting the material go where it wanted to go. You know, I, I forged, forged the blank sort of lozenge flat shape off the two and a half inch and then just worked it round, let it go where it wanted to go. Did you use a torch to kind of pull in the edges? No, that's all done. This one's all done in a, in a Coke fire. I, I took okay. I took my Coke fire out of my forge this year. It's weird. Just got induction and propane now. Oh, wow. felt a bit like cutting my own heart out, but um, <laughs> couldn't can't get good quality fuel up here, so it's almost not worth having. We make do, you know. We make do. Um, what kind of steel are you using? Oh, that's just hot rolled, A36. Cheap and cheap and nasty. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll use cold rolled sometimes. It's nice for rivet stock because you know it's going to fit. Um, yeah, mostly just mild steel. I, I love it. You know, it does everything I want to do and not building the structures. So I'm not worried about its, its strength properties. Um, so then that, this is taking um, that really plastic. Plastica, I think they call it in Europe, that style of forging and applying it into a, a lightly representational sort of study. This one, um, again, it's, it's, it's this idea of chasing movement and, and, and keeping movement in the finished piece of work. This, this one I call a study in smoke. And, you know, smoke is an incredibly ephemeral thing. It, it is never, ever, ever still. Um, and it doesn't last for very long and it blows away in the wind. And I said, well, if I can, I want to, I want to capture that in, in this ridiculous material we will you know, describe it'd be like working. So this was, I think I started with a block of like three by two or something like you know, big, heavy stuff. And, you know, just kind of, I just wanted to, to, to goop it out into this shape that looked like it was you know, blowing away in the breeze. And I think I kind of, I think I kind of got it. You know? looks like you give it a little puff and it'll, it'll take off and disappear. But it's 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 that blend then of an idea you have in your head and a set of processes that you find you're comfortable with and, and finding ways to tie those together and, and and having some kind of for me always some kind of a story there or at least an idea in the background beyond just exploring the shape for the sake of exploring the shape. Which then brings me to figurative work, which is probably what I like to do the most. Um, and I think that's just because I'm a human being and, and the bulk of my meaningful interactions on this planet are with other human beings. Um, and an awareness too, I think that in most of our interactions and, you know, I, I can't remember what the scientific number is, but, you know, a vast percentage of how we communicate as human beings with each other is nonverbal. It's in, it's in our gesture and our movements and, and how we hold ourselves and how we are in conversation and in interactions. Um, and I found, as I began to do these human forms, that gesture was this wonderful thing to capture. Um, this was this was my first ever figurative piece, and it wasn't ever meant to be a figurative piece. But as I was forging it, what I saw was this sort of, you know, Egyptian sort of Saharan African sort of queen lady. The poise of the sculpture as I was holding it around just looked very regal, and it's not really, you know, a person. I mean, there's obviously there's a head and a body and there's hips and there's a leg, but the the way the the thing stands has a, to me a very sort of majestic feel to it. Um, and it really, sorry, I'm just going to go and turn my oven off. I do apologize. Um, what was I talking about? Sculptures. Um, someone hit me with a question right now. It'd be awesome. <laughs> this is figurative, and you were going with a Saharan majestic. Saharan uh, majestic. Look. Yeah, and, and yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I, this was my first one, and it really. Oh, 
that's it. Um, this was my first real use of that kind of very volumetric based forging um, you know, coming from the English tradition where you are trained essentially to use lots of small pieces fire welded and joined together to create a whole you know if you look at an English traditional English gate and you know it's lots of little pieces and all stuck together and it's all very fine and very twiddly and it's nice and it's technically very 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 accomplished but it is, it's essentially a series of lines uh, whereas the, the the European the modern European style and you're coming out of Italy and, and Germany in the 60s was very much about using the volume of the material to to allow you to extrude a shape from it using you know, the equipment that was becoming available at the time in big hammers and such. So this was my first play with that and and I was you know really sort of dictated the course of my career from that point onwards I would think um, which would be around when. This was probably 98, 99, I would say, about then. Oh, wow. this, is, this is one of the only sculptures that I've made that I own myself. I've kept this one. We have a, question. We have a question, Jake. Yeah. Um, did yeah, you yeah. draw this one out? No, no. It was supposed to originally. I was working. Are you, a lot of Californians, you, a lot of you know Richard Bent, right? He's come and demonstrated for you guys quite a bit. Yes. Think? Anyway, Absolutely. Um, I, he, he's who I trained with out of college in, in the UK and uh, very, very interesting his design approach and our, our styles have, have, have wildly diverged, but you know, um, he, he was very into the organic, um, organic representational forging. Um, and so I was working with him and, and I designed this kind of gothic -y sculpture, uh, just candle holder and, and, and that had gone down a whole different route. And then I was like, I'm gonna make this double ended sycamore or maple, you know, whirly gig seed which you could probably see in the top there is you know, kind of what I was going for. And then as I was forging it, this thing started to sort of grow in my hands instead of uh, sycamore seed. And, um, yeah, so it was not, it was not drawn out. It was, it was uh, a natural evolution at the hammer. It's the best kind of evolution, I think. Um, and then moving, you know, moving on with, with the sculptural things again, very, very simple forgings, but capturing subtlety in in human gestures i think then tells the story of the piece so i did this for for a lady and it was originally designed to sort of be a prima donna like map ballerina on stage with that that absolute sort of self-confidence bordering on arrogance sort of pose um I've, I've reproduced a shape similar to this in, in, a, in a bullfighting sculpture as that sort of bravado of the puff chest and the little, little kick of the shoulders and you know but there's, you know, there's not much to it, really. It's just, it's a, I think this is a piece of three-quarter round um, and a set of uh, a set of spring fullers and, and a top fuller um, as all the tooling. But I think, I like to think that it captures that sense of you know, non-verbal something that we all, we all carry with us everywhere we go. Um, and then, you know, moving from very simple human form to slightly more complex ones um, that maybe are telling a bit of a different story. This was another collaborative piece. Um, Dennis, you worked on this one, didn't you? I think you did. This, this yes. was a John, John McClellan's in, again. Yeah, this, this, we did this at John McClellan's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, Can you this, talk about this, the size of this? Yeah, yeah, this one's life size. So it's six or seven feet yeah. tall. With the fella, it's um, called First Kiss, I believe. Called, called, yeah, it's called First Touch, um, or First Touch. Okay, First Touch. So, so I, 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 I drew this one um, with the with the the thought in my mind that it would be um, like in a in a in a in a corridor or, or in a club or a bar or wherever it is you happen to maybe you know meet that special someone. This hand is not is not pushing someone else away. This hand is resting up against a wall. And it's it's that that intimate moment as as a, as a couple you know begin to begin to you know broach that possible idea of oh you know how about those how about those those lips honey you know um, right. um and and for me this one was really interesting because it's playing with again all the things I like to play with in steel they've got lots of lots of nice squishy forging you've got some fun joinery you know there's lots of excuses to swing power hammers and sledgehammers and, and do all, all the fun stuff. 
but at the end of at the end of the project you have something that is you know really intimate i think and and to me that's about as opposite as you can get with you know what you would imagine a chunk of steel would, would produce um so yeah i really i really enjoyed making this piece too and it was a fun one to make you know you've got a bunch of roughly tufty blacksmiths you know and, and and we're making this incredibly very gentle very soft sculpture um yeah that the that the end of the day uh, tells her hmm? right brett really liked having the boob he part. did he, he did he, he did the boob yeah so, <laughs> that's all right you know hey he, he can he can enjoy that it's yeah. fine yeah yeah he yeah. did a good um, job yeah it's very nice very perky and everything but uh, you know, I but you know, you look at the sculpture too, and you think, well, if someone sees that and they don't know what I was going for, it's also a very protective sculpture. It's still telling sort of a similar story, but you could interpret it a different way. And I, you know, I like that about all art, right? We, you know, unless someone's telling you that you have to believe a certain thing when you look at a sculpture, you can you can look at it any way you want. Right. Um, but I think I, you know, it's just a weird thing. You had a good time. It's, it's, it's a stick of steel. Yet it absolutely, I think, conveys that little moment that we've all had at some point in our lives, you know, that frisson where this is gonna happen. And it's, you know, it's such a powerful moment. We've all had one, we've all shared one, you know, to be able to capture it in, you know, a piece of two inch square and a piece of flat bar. It's pretty cool, I reckon. You know, Jake, I reckon we have a question. Um, yeah. Are the arms riveted? Are those components riveted together? Yeah, they're, they're, they're riveted through there, yeah. Yeah, layered and riveted in there. So yeah, and on on most of these, I'll try and use you know on on the collaborative pieces especially, you know, I'll try and use as much traditional joinery as possible. And, and in fact, in general, I mean, it's it's one of the things that I love about forging is is the joinery side of it. So you know, where when I can not weld, I will not weld, um, not out of any sense of snobbery, but just because I I like mechanical joinery so much. And yes, you did draw it first. Uh, I did. I did the, this one we drew first, and then Dennis blew up and 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 he he sketched it out life size and actually cut a bunch of templates, which was really cool, pretty useful. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I I have a little projector. I projected it on the wall, the size that Jake wanted it. You know, traced it, and then took some sixteen gauge and plasma cut out all the different pieces and each of the team members got a piece and they mm -hmm. took it off to their fourth and finished it. So Good. that was, that was very slick indeed. Enjoyed that. So is this basically life size, Jake? Yeah, I, th I think it's like seven feet tall. I think that the dude is seven feet tall. Yeah, it's a big one. Uh -huh. It was, was like three days. We, we rocked it. Mostly because we had Andrew Policio on a sledgehammer, so he pretty much made the whole thing by himself. And we just stuck it together afterwards. I think we did it in like a day and a half. Was it a day and a half? Really? We we were. I mean, we were yeah, rocking. Yeah, yeah, it might have been. It was. It was. It was good times. Yeah. So. Um. So then again, toying with these these narrative ideas and 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 this idea of of of, of various different emotions that you can bring it. That you can bring into stuff. Um, this is another one done at Center for Metal Arts in uh, in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. Um, this was starting to, to to play a little bit with with ideas of mythology, which is another another sort of thing I like to bring into some of the, my sculptural work. Um, and and I wanted to make a very I wanted to make a blacksmith sculpture because it's it's center for metal arts it's it's cambry ryan works it's you know it's the birthplace of the north american iron industry pretty much and i wanted to do something that was a, a sort of a heroic memorialization of blacksmithing but i didn't want to do it based in hard industry because we are not hard industrial blacksmiths while we may rely on a lot of industrial process and and have, have developed from a heavy industry and we as, as individuals as, as modern blacksmiths definitely not so i 
sort of just toying with mythology and some of the shapes and then you know i kind of was leaning into this kind of slightly arthurian kind of feel you know the sword in the stone kind of pose there with the hammer on the anvil and you know the, the hair is a little bit sort of you know norse kind of you know viking-esque um just you know it has that it's very sort of it's just quite a static piece but at the same time quite dramatic and you know the 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 angle of the shoulders and the way the arms fold there in very strong very you know very confident in in what it is and and you know it's something that I feel as a blacksmith, I'm you know, extremely confident in who I am because of what I am. Um, so that was sort of, you know, encapsulating that here, but, you know, bringing in different themes, you know, this, this, this sort of mythological kind of heroic sort of thing. And then someone went, you know, put a room in circle with sort of marks in the back of it just because you had to do that. Um, Dredging again, very, this looks seven or eight feet tall. Yeah, oh, this one I think was ten feet tall to the top of the the, the spikes on the sun. Yeah, we had a week on this one too. There's some, so there's some big, there's some big forgings in this one. Um, it, was, it was a pretty, pretty cool piece. Um, had a thought, can't remember what it was. Confidence, awesome. Oh, the, the, just the, the the yeah, the gesture and and. Uh, mm, mm, it's interesting you're getting into into sort of sculptures that, that are narrative and they have they've got representation in them you know they're represent the work that i enjoy doing the most is representational to a point but uh you know it's i think it's interesting you've got two choices haven't you you can go down the literal the route and, and really chase the detail uh in 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 something you know you can forge your face to its extreme detail if, if you want to or, or you can make hands incredibly lifelike and i don't do any of that stuff with my work and i deliberately stay away from it um, and try and do everything through through gesture and and, and just a sort of an, an implication of, of the thing that i'm trying to go for um, and so mythology Obviously, every culture everywhere in the world has their own mythologies, and they're all deeply fascinating. You know, up here in Canada, in uh, well, for me, it's the Pacific Southeast of Canada, but I guess we have to go with Pacific Northwest. You know, we have an incredibly long history of uh, First Nation culture here, and some really cool mythology that goes along with that. So uh, I teamed up with a, a local. Um, master carver, Nuchanul carver, so he's you know, uh, indigenous to, to Vancouver Island. Um, and we'd done a bunch of work previously and, and you know, I've always been fascinated by this kind of weird, slightly violent, fairly horrific at times, you know, meeting of cultures. And this weird, you know, noble savage thing that we as, as, as Westerners are prone to doing and I don't buy into that. And uh, me and my friend Moy was just like, no, it's horrible. We were thoroughly vile to each other, and all and, and all these all the stories, all all the stories we have, are, they're generally terrifying. You know, they're stories created by people who lived in this narrow band of coastal land that had you know a wild ocean and fog out to one side, and deep impenetrable forests to the other side, and they were full of these terrifying creatures. And we we back and forth with a bunch of ideas of, of who we would like to represent. And we 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 settled on the, the blue heron. So this is a traditional blue heron mask uh, in the Nuchano style, mounted onto my interpretation of a, of a First Nation story and and in First Nation Pacific Northwest um, stories, the 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 creatures will all have a human sort of uh, form and an animal form and then their spirit form. Didn't really play with the spirit form on this one, but we did this this heron who is in mid transition from his human to his heron form, and he's climbing down off this old growth log and he's you know about to come you know snarling out of the fog and, and, and attack the, the local coastal raiders um i mean what you know we wanted to make this very menacing spooky sculpture um that you know i i like the feeling of this one that if this isn't was in the corner of your room and you were getting up in the night to you know have a drink of water or go to the bathroom or something and caught a glimpse of this out the corner of your eye it'd give you the heebie-jeebies um, it totally would. So you know, where is this piece? 
Uh, it's current. It's currently on display at a local um, uh, sort of lavender distillery place, and I'm about to go and collect it from them, and and then it will be going for sale on the open market. I don't, unfortunately, have any gallery representation. Exciting. Yeah, wow. most most of my so, sculptural done done um, in, in these big collaborative events, and and uh, and then the bulk of my work has been you know, commission based. But, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so this is again life size. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty big piece. Yeah, we haven't done anything more with him, but uh, I, I would like to to revisit it because I think it's a really and also there's the 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 history behind the two cultures. You know, we 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 you know, Cedar and I, and you know when they met, it was pretty violent, um, and I really love working the two materials that are the backbones of the, the societies that they represent. You know, iron is the backbone of European society and cedar is the backbone of, of uh, West Coast First Nations culture. And iron is generally viewed by First Nations people as not a very nice material. It doesn't come with a good association for them. You know, there's hundreds of years of, of iron representing you know, sociological destruction all over the world. Um, so I really like to do this piece, you know, you could call it a reconciliation sculpture in a way, but where you're bringing these two very representational materials of their independent cultures and bringing them together into something that is telling a new and maybe spooky, but positive story that they can work together. You know, there is a, there is a future for these two materials that is not, it's not, it's not a fight, it doesn't have to be. I really enjoy that. Where is this piece, Jake? It's on, it's still here on Vancouver Island. I'm, I'm going to be bringing it back to my showroom fairly soon here. I, I really like the idea. I mean, what I see is, is, is this a creature that's, that's bringing death or is this a creature that's dying itself? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. So it's really skeletal, right? Yeah. 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 I, th I think you could ask a lot of questions, you know, if you if you wanted to on on this piece, you know. It's, yeah, it's really cool. That the heron, you know, the heron in First Nations culture is he's he's a he's a guy you want to keep happy because he he was in control of, of this bentwood box that contained all the fog. So if he was in a bad mood, he would open his bentwood box and let all the fog out, and you know, your, uh, your canoe full of hunters who are out on the sea might not make it home that day. So you had to keep him pretty happy. You know, he was a, he was a powerful coastal figure. So. You know, there's there's so much narrative built into the into the the existing stories, and then you know you make a you make a sculpture like this, based on that history, but you're telling an entirely new version of it. So I think that's I find that really interesting. And, and with the First Nations too, a lot of the art is it is it is maintaining a culture that has been you know bashed around sideways all over the place, and they are. They are retelling the stories from their past and their cultural stories and their history, but they haven't created, in many cases, new variants of those stories. And I really would love to work with this guy and create, like, uh, you know, the modern boogeyman. You know, the, the blue heron's not quite as scary as he was, you know, 200 years ago. Understand now that fog is a natural phenomenon, but fentanyl's really bad. You know, and the dude peddling fentanyl is really harsh. Let's make a sculpture of him with some gnarly First Nations mask. You know, tell tell a story from the twenty first century that fights you know, right. well, that stuff. Yeah. We have we Powerful. haven't got there yet. We Powerful. Got there. But yes, so playing with playing with the the darker side of um of of emotions. Um, this was a little oh, blimey. This was a little piece I did. Um, it's called After the Fall. And it's playing again with uh, mythology, this time toying with some Greek mythology. Um, the story of Daedalus and Icarus, we all know it. Um, I think we all know it. Um, but it's always represented, it, re represented it, it's always represented in the drama of Icarus's fall. You know, most sculptures and, and paintings you see of that story are of Icarus mid-fall, wings extended, plunging towards the ocean. And to me, that, you know, as as a as a parent, um, it ignores the the really horrific side of that story, which is you know, you've got a dad left behind who's just watched his kid plunge into the ocean and die, you know, having just told him, "Don't fly too close to the sun, you silly bastard," and and what does he go and do? So I 
I wanted to retell the story from the perspective of the grieving dad. Um, and I, you know, I, I can't claim to have lived a life full of, full of you know, horrific sadness, but I think um, mortality is something we all, we all think about quite a lot. And, you know, representations of mortality uh, you know, is, is such a powerful force to kind of follow in, in sculpture. It makes for some, some good basis of design work. Um, the dad still wearing the wings certainly still he's, is part of the problem of the. It does, but and it's also it's also an idea there that the wings, you know, wings are, which are so often we see them as a symbol of flight and freedom. Here they are, they're weighing him down with the grief of, of what they created, which is you know the death of his son. So they've become a, a mourning mantle, not not a not a freeing and expressive. The uh, scale of this piece, Jay? Oh, this one's little. This one's like uh, eighteen inches tall or something. Yeah, the wings, the wings and feathers are bronze, so I added a little bit of color to it. I really like this one. Yeah. That's just a detail of, you know, the sad face of Daedalus looking down at his lost boy. Um, so then, then with uh, with narrative and story again, play a lot with mythology. I'm also, you know, really enjoy the cut and thrust of a good political discussion. Um, so I do bring, when I can, a little bit of sort of current affair commentary into some of my sculptures. Um, this one was forged in 2016 uh, at uh, Carbondale. Um, the sculpture is called Lady Liberty's Lament. Um, and it shows, if you can see it, the Statue of Liberty looking a bit frustrated that things are going a bit haywire. And she's thrown down her book onto her pedestal, which you can't see in the photo, but it's got a big crack in it and her torch is extinguished and she's marching off to try and find something a little bit healthier. Um, so you can put your own interpretation on that sculpture if you like, but uh, you know, I was trying to tell my, uh, um, my perspective on, on, a, on a political trend that was happening at the time in, in your country um, that had ramifications for the rest of us. But uh, you know, the, 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 the um, the gesture that I was trying to capture was of, of sort of forlorn hopelessness and disgust. Um, you know, shoulders are slumped. You think the Statue of Liberty is this mighty, powerful statue with arms raised and head chin up to the sky and all the rest of it. And, and here, here, she, here she is, um, you know, shoulders slumped and arms down. Head Similar bowed. scale to the Icarus piece? Yeah, yeah, a little piece, yeah. This was just a little one, a one day, one day collaborative sculpture that we did, um, which then brings me to another one forged around a similar time. This was done down at Adams Forge with Heather and crew. Um, again, this is a sculpture informed by a sense of place and a sense of what was going on at the time. Um, this one's called uh, the Fallen Angel. Um, made in LA, City of Angels, um, obviously, but also a city that may have one or two homeless people living on the streets there. Um, so I wanted to do this sort of this juxtaposition again, you know, the wings, an angel is a very relic, isn't it? You know, it's all the things um, flying through the sky and, you know, empowered and all the rest of it. Uh, whereas this fella is clearly a bit broken, you know, he's clutching his beer can and his, his wings are his wings are anchoring to the ground, his, his halo is askew. Um, and he's he's begging with his with his with his baseball cap. Um, so it's it's you know it is a it is an of its time and of its place sculpture. Um, lots of really, really fun forging in it, you know, all again playing with all those all those shapes that, that I that I like to play with. Um, but you know, it's got a bit of a bite to it in terms of in terms of the commentary it's trying to make. Um, the hat, in fact, is uh, I'm not showing it there, but carved across the front of the hat says "Make America Great Again," which were some hats I saw around in the states a few years ago. Um, but it's got no bottom in it. So my my thoughts on this is that you know you you can toss your hopes and dreams into all kinds of uh, rhetoric, but you know it's just going to fall out onto the ground and be way be lost, um, or it, it might just be that, you know, tossing money to a beggar is a hopeless cause, but, uh, you know, you can take your own flavor from that. But uh, 
again gestural you know this this bowed back the the, the bowed head the halo askew you know yeah i really 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 like this piece i think it really felt what i was trying to create and and really executed well by the people working on it too it was a lot of fun any questions the size of this piece again i think i remember seeing this one it's about four feet across yeah i think you'd be about right yeah i think yeah four feet across yeah yeah just to, just for timing uh sake jake we're at about an hour right now just in terms of your of your presentation and how far you want to carry it i can uh, go just to give you i can up. go all night but um it just depends on <laughs> how just people want to hear me droning on um now we're, we're getting to the end of the sculptural stuff i think so um i think i'm i'm doing i'm good for time i'm i'm happy to talk for as long as you lot want to listen to me but uh if anyone needs to, if anyone needs to peel off really quickly then you better better tell me to hurry up um okay so this is this is staying within this this kind of slightly darker more sort of engaging with with the pathos and, and the sadder end of, of human emotion um and again tying very much into into sort of political ideas and you know i am say probably quite liberal in a lot of my political ideas i i believe that we are all decent people at the end of the day and it bothers me when i see people not treated in that way um i don't know if you remember i don't know if this photo made it um into north america uh, lot but uh right at the height of well, the height it's still going on but when it was really peaking a few years ago um the, the migrant crossings of the mediterranean it was actually about the time when there was all the well, beginning of the massive furor of the, of the you know the, the border stuff down with you guys in mexico um there was a photo showed up on the net and it was just heart-wrenching of a four-year-old boy who had washed up and drowned on a beach in italy and it was you know, it's one of those things that pops up on the news and you just look at it and you say, man, we are shit. We are just awful. Like how, how does that happen? Um, you know, as a dad, you just have all those moments of it's like, I can't even imagine the situation that led to this. So I can't imagine it. I don't want to. And I don't want to imagine how I am part of a society that lets this happen. Um, so I was then invited to, to Ratho Buyers, which is uh, Pete Hill and Shona Johnson up in Edinburgh. And, and Shona said, I want a really hard hitting piece. I want something that's going to make us all think. And this photo had, had appeared and I was like, man, what just, just what? What, what even are we trying to do here in this world? So, so this is my, my response to that photo. It was the parents and that little child and, and, you know, the hopes and dreams that they had in trying to come to Europe from, from Syria or, a bombed out country that, that that exists and and what they got was you know their son drowned and the hate of all the people that live in europe telling him to go back home again and, and and it's how that would break you as a human being so so it's called they deserve a better welcome um and it was a weird one because it was really really fun workshop the forgings in that were really fun there are some super sexy shapes and we had a really good crew, people from all over the world came for this one and, and it was it was epic. And then we got to the end of the five days. Maybe it wasn't five. Yeah, I can't remember what it five days, three days. We got to the end of it and we put the sculpture together and and you know, we put the final rivets in and we all stood back and we we're just like, oh, oh man. <laughs> I feel really sad. But it, you know, it filled the fulfilled the brief, the hard hitting. And and for me, it told a story that I think is very important. And it expressed part of my um, personal way of thinking that it, it's very important to me. So, um, and also is full of really, really, really nice blacks. So yeah, that's that one. So on that cheerful note, any questions on my sculptural uh, doodadling at this point? So I'm now going to transition to how I take all that sculpturalness and all that narrative stuff and how I try and bring it into actual work. So, Jake, on that last one, uh, you have a teddy bear and some tennis shoes sitting there. Are those actual, literal teddy bear and tennis shoes? Yeah, if yeah, so, how does that how does that last? I mean, the steel will uh, be around uh, in a hundred years. The the the, the teddy yeah, the, it's the, it's a it's an actual teddy bear and, and it's the sneakers and it's it's representation of all these all these parents 
have left of, of their child. Um, in terms of longevity, no, nope, they'll rot out and, and, and at some point would need to be replaced. Um, I, I don't think they are essential to the sculpture, but they certainly give it a lot of flavor. Um, but yeah, no, in, in terms of, yeah, they're not, they're not designed to last, you know, and, and could, be, could be fairly easily replaced you know, should, should the, the need arise. Yeah. All right, is that it on sculptural stuff? We all good? Have I explained myself reasonably well? well you've done a wonderful job, Jake. Uh, those are the words what? I like. Yeah. Outstanding. <laughs> Outstanding. Okay. All Powerful. Right. So sculptural, obviously, I've, you know, there's a lot there, isn't there? Lots of, lot to think about, I think, for me anyway. Um, and it's, it is very much, uh, my work is very much form and process driven. Um, you know, that's really what feeds it. And, and then into that, I have, I have blended this desire to tell stories and, 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 you know, and create a narrative within the work. But it's very self-referential, you know, in terms of technically how I do it. I try and, try and do new techniques every now and again and learn a new skill every, every now and again. But you know, I've I have over the course of my career got very comfortable with a, with a certain way of moving the material that allows me to express what it is I want to do um, really really well. And if I try and do it in with you know, if I tried to do repose, it would yeah, you know, I'm not very good at it, so um, it wouldn't generate the same impact for me that that, that I'm seeking to to, to uh, create. But, so I, so I spoke at, at the beginning, you know, when I look at other people's websites or I'm looking at other people's work, I generally will avoid the architectural until I've had a really good look at their sculptural um, work. And that is because, you know, there's just, there are so many restrictions on you as a designer when you get into sculptural work. And you know, really, we all just want to, to forge and make cool shapes and, and have all the fun with it. And, and it can be really frustrating. Um, you know, get into a big architectural job, it's going to be in your shop for months on end. And you know, you can find find yourself tied to something that it's just really not that interesting. So, it's, you know, how do we how do we blend this idea of freedom and movement and and story and all the rest of it into a railing or a fireplace or whatever it is we happen to be to be asked to make? And you know, I think for most of us, then there are a few people who are really lucky who, who get to actually make a living being artists and making sculpture. But for most of us, we're gonna you know we're gonna pay the bills. You know, building railings and, and fireplaces and such. So, um, I think the main thing that I really try and and uh, and do with my designing in architectural work is to keep that sense of movement um, going. Um, and this this job here was there was quite a lot of it. Um, some of it exterior, some interior. Um, house was just a big concrete box. All the lines were super hard. There was nothing soft in this house at all. And it's like, man, you gotta, people have got to live in this. And it's just brutal, but you know, whatever, that was their, their flavor. But um, I created this, this railing. It's, it's right next to the ocean. So we, you know, I played with a theme that I'm really comfortable with, which is you know, the sea and movement and, and the sort of wave-esque sort of shapes. Um, and took a very simple forging. It's just a piece of flat bar that is, has that got a, a half twist in it, essentially with a fuller and a half twist. And then did these kind of swooping lines. So um, on this railing, and you know, the rest of it's in modern house. The rest of it is very, very harsh, and, and not harsh, but it, it's you know, it's pretty solid and pretty, pretty square. But you, you know, running down this railing, you have this continually moving um, panel design. The no, you know, there's there's no point where you stand ever in this house where you get. Um, Two things that will look the same and i was going to put a video on this but i didn't but as you walk down it and you turn to look at it the whole thing is just you know it gives the appearance that it is moving because you have you know plane changes and you have different shadow lines and you have different spacings all happening at once and your eye just kind of creates like you know like those flick books that we used to make you know in school right to you get this idea that it's still moving um and it's the only soft thing in the entire house, and, and I, that that for me was you know, really really an important thing to try and to try and bring in for them. 
Um, it wasn't that fun to make. There's a lot of fabrication, but the end result was was really effective. You know, with a very very simple simple design. Um, but then they let me loose on the outside of the house, um, which was nice. Um, so we did these big hot tub screens. They're both eight feet tall. Um, and again, playing with that wave theme, we did a little ocean scene. There's the sun setting into a, into a into the waves and sort of reflection of the sun in the waves. Kind of a big big squishy thing. Galvanized steel. Lots of nice big soft forgings. But you know, it's 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 that. I think it's it's letting yourself be fairly free in how you approach an architectural design. You know, they they wanted a hot tub screen for privacy. That that's their hot tub in in there. They didn't want their neighbor who lives over here staring right into their big deck. So, you know, they, they just wanted uh, something to block it off. And they came to me because I'd done the rest of the ironwork in the house. And I just didn't really look at anything other than a big blank canvas um, and the brief that you shouldn't be able to see through it too easily. Um, and it's the nicest thing in the whole house, I reckon. The rest of it's a little bit rigid for my taste, but you got this cool sort of cartoon hanging off the side of the building. It's super awesome. Um, and you know, really nice juxtaposition with the harsh concrete and the, and the stainless railing and stuff that we did. You've got this suddenly very soft and, and, and living kind of sculpture, sculptural thing. Um, there's that shape again. Um, there's, these were some lights that I did for a house. He didn't want to see any actual light. He just wanted light and shadow and, and that kind of play. So, you know, there, there's just a, an absolute direct translation of, oh, here's a shape I really like. How can I build this into a particular project for a particular climb? And the lights were really cool. Um, you know, the plate was hot cut and then, and then dished so that the cuts ripped open a bit more. Um, yeah, nice. Just, you know, how do, how do I build what I love to do into a project where none, there isn't necessarily a reason to be doing this kind of forging? Um, and I think we all do that with our own designs. I've, Unless you're absolutely snookered by a client who doesn't like this particular thing, you're going to push hard, aren't you, to 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 get your own style and in, into into a into a project. All right, Jake. So I have something to admit here. I okay. <laughs> I love your circle forging. Yes, I mean, uh, yeah. So I tried to duplicate it, of course, because I wanted to see. I'm like, that's, that seems so simple. Um, and I used a little washer that mm -hmm. was, it was a steel washer, not coated. Um, oh, I think it was three inches wide and I cut, you know, a wedge out of it. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that you've done these so many times, you know, the amount of steel that needs to be removed in order for it to get to the top with that little two inch whatever that is space at the top because yes i was i thought i did mathematically and perfectly you do okay okay i guess made it pretty i guess made it pretty good oh but, but I, was, I don't i, I, I don't failed. i don't start with a curve i start with a flat bar oh okay yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. You start with All a curve, right. you're just going to end up making it an eternal spiral. It was. And then it was really difficult to work with. <laughs> I, gen I generally find it's about two thirds of the inside circumference. So the circumference inside diameter generally gets you fairly close to it on, on, a, on like a one inch floor. Like Oh, they all, that makes they sense. All, they all respond differently because, you know, if you use a broader fuller, you get more stretch, but less definition, you know one like this, you're not going to get the whole shape just by forging it. Well, actually, no, these ones we did, but you, you know, you're going to have to go around a mandrel. And <coughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It depends, you know, if you if you work the fuller down really aggressively and, and go for a, a, you know, a much more aggressively forged but less defined forging, you're going to create a much tighter radius. There's a lot of control in there. So as you're forging it, you know, you, you take your first hit, you know, in, in near that, what you want to leave for your ridge on the inside, and you take a couple of pinches with your fuller, and then you you, know, you work your bar out towards you away from the fullers on the on the hammer, and and obviously as it forges more on the outside edge, it stretches more. Right. You create, right. You create that you create that radius. You've then got the control. If you go too tight, you can push 
material back right. into the floor, stretch the inside edge and that will increase your radius again. So you have quite a bit of control over it before you have to go yeah. and start knocking it around with a mandrel. Wow. This, this one was three feet across outside, I would say, and it's four by half. And that particular dimension came out almost perfectly just forging it didn't have to do too much um beating yeah around. it did yeah. it came out great yep. yeah it's uh, i know I, I really i just i just love the shape it's it's everything about forging for me that, that, that you know i just really enjoy um and yeah you can just using it in a different in a different shape um or a different uh application so this was a bench i made based on 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 our local beaches where we have these very pebbly beaches covered in driftwood you know the waves wash the driftwood onto the beaches so um, this is my west coast bench uh, and these ones yeah they're a couple of feet across and they're forged out of thicker material i think that's one by four i think i forged those out of inch and a half fullers um, yeah so you know just just finding ways to build in what you love to to a, to a design functional realm of things. And then this is getting into a, a, a railing and this, this would be a blend for me of various different things that I touch on with my sculptural work. Some of it um, playing with the mythology and, and, and drawing for me shapes here uh, influenced by uh, First Nation design here. In, in you know, Northwest, this very blocky geometric sort of shape, shapes that they use. So I haven't lifted a shape directly. I'm not trying to tell, you know, a, a First Nation narrative, but I'm using, I'm using the influence of those shapes in the same way that I would draw influence from an environment or, or another, you know, abs source of influence. I don't know. Saying is, say you want to design a gate that's going to be industrial based, you're going to use lots of rivets and whatever, you know. The client on this wanted something that was influenced by both uh, Art Nouveau and First Nations uh, styles. So this is this this was my my thing that I called uh, West Coast Nouveau. So we have these very obviously uh, European Art Nouveau shapes blending into this very kind of blocky geometric uh, First Nation West Coast sort of art style. Um, and for me, it's all about the movement um, and again creating these shapes that sort of appear to keep going um your eye gets drawn in there's there's a focus on on this railing um which is this section here and everything in the railing is guiding your eye to rest here which i think is important um something like a railing which can be sort of plain sometimes you want to draw the person across it sometimes you want to draw their eye to a particular point in it what i don't like is busy for the sake of busy where your eye is just kind of jittering all over the place like you've drunk too much coffee but it never has anywhere calm to settle so you, know, you can look at it like a traditional style railing and all the scrolls and leaves and bells and whistles and it's just like whoa, 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 whoa. And, and you look at it and it's just it's not calming it's not nice to me um, so so when i'm designing railings I, I do have that in the back yeah wanting to wanting to really create a piece that you interact with in your brain you know whether it's just just in just in calming you down as you walk up the stairs but you know, i don't want i don't want to blah, i don't want to give that to people that's that's, that's intense um, and yeah you know playing with those circle shapes again so there, there's there's my logo almost it's in a circle with a break in the top of it um hey uh glenn is asking about uh, did you have to do with building codes, spacings? Uh, uh, yes, this this one here. Yeah, absolutely, we do. Um, in Canada, and we we were absolutely hammered by it up until fairly recently. They even had a ladder rule in Canada where you couldn't actually create a railing that was supposed to have any toe holds in it. They've got rid of that thankfully because it was absolutely stupid. Um, this railing is in, uh, in a private home. It is post inspection. They didn't have small kids. This opening here is over four inches. So it would not pass a building code, but we did 
come up with a little detail that could be retrofitted to it in the event that he wants to sell the house, um, which he doesn't. But uh, yes, everything else is everything else fits the hundred mil rule. You know, the four inch code rule on this one. But yes, that is always a factor, and it's one of any. Yeah, it can be a really limiting factor in a railing too. Um, this was another West Coast Nouveau railing I did. I had a client come to me having seen the first one and, and wanted that in his house. I tried so hard to give him something new, but he absolutely dug his heels in and wanted wanted West Coast Nouveau. And I went a little bit more, um, played, a little, played a little more heavily with the, sort of the geometric First Nations sort of shape on, on it and use, using more so sort of bigger solid forms like the blocks of color that you see in a lot of the Pacific Northwest art. Um, but again, not taking a representational story and trying to retell it um, itself. I don't really have any claim to any of that stuff. Um, and, you know, changing the way the circle form was made to, to do something that I actually was, you know, really enjoy forging. Again, creates that continual sense of movement, even though it ends there, it doesn't really end there. Um, did a whole bunch of panels on this house, different styles. A lot of this work, you know, blending into it, coming off off the uh, the previous stuff. And then at the top, we did a center panel that was much more nouveau based, um, getting into a little bit of figurative forging. And I didn't install this railing; it was built during COVID, so I shipped it down to him, and he installed it. And never got finished photos of it. Well, um, but yeah. You know, classic nouveau shapes. You know, there's such a nice style to play with because it's all about movement. It just it lends itself so well to forge steel uh, and throwing in a little bit of the stuff I like to do. So that's that one. And then I'm going to finish up here on the architectural work with um, gates because these are my absolute favorite things to make. Um, I think yeah, I think gates can be so many things uh, in terms of how you approach them. You know, is it is it a barrier to entry? Is it a welcome to entry? Is it a keep something in? Is it a keep something out? Is it a definition point between two significant areas of of, of a landscape? It's just there's, there's there's tons that can go on in a gate. Um, I, you know, I really enjoy designing for that sort of part of the brief, but then past that, a gate is essentially, it's just a sculpture that swings. It has to close, it has to open, um, and it may have some other details, like it's got to keep the dog in or whatever, the neighbor out or whatever, whatever they want to go with. You've basically just got the space in which you can make absolutely anything you like as long as the client likes it and it works. Um, you don't have the restrictions of, of uh, railing, you know, you haven't got the complications fireplace you haven't got to deal with the electrics that you've got with the lighting so you know, i really enjoy gates are the closest thing you can get to doing sculpture while still being a functional blacksmith um so this one's playing with again the sort of the first nation s sort of styling with with the sort of raven gate um one of the things i really like to play with on gates is to dispatch with the idea of having to use a frame you know you get rid of the frame you immediately free up your your Ability to design, you just have a space, and your sculpture can imply that it's moving outside of that space way easier if it is not confined in a box. So um, yeah, that's the first thing I do when I am designing a gate is don't even think about putting it in a frame unless it is an extremely traditional design that requires a frame, and that's an entirely different sort of process. Um, Modern materials, using heavier materials, our ability to join things, you know, the use of sneaky welds to, to add rigidity. You know, you can, you're not tied to this idea that you've got to have a bottom rail, a mid bar and a top bar, and you've got to have diagonal um, bracing in a gate or it'll sag because, well, I'm going to use a piece of four by one for the bottom bar and I'm going to build everything off that and it can't sag because it's a piece of four by one. So, you know, you can, you can free up your design, um, approach by using a modern forging style and different materials and different use of materials to give you a mechanical advantage that was you know, not available in the past um, and then and then it's just a matter of tying in again the things that you love to do um, so yeah this is this is a, a, a raven a ra ooh, ooh, 
a raven in uh, in the moonlight flying over flying over a forest. You know, very very emblem emblematic of the Pacific Northwest. You know, I've definitely lifted shapes that you would say are heavily influenced by um, indigenous Northwest design, but I haven't taken the narrative part of a story and tried to retell it. It's really important. Um, but you would identify this, I think, as a Northwest based gate if you can see it out and about. Um, and then I'm just going to touch on these. These are three gates I did actually from my parents' house in Cornwall. I think maybe it was a guilt project, you know, living so far away from them for so long. But I grew up in this environment. This is the west coast of England. Um, and it's this incredibly, incredibly rugged environment, this long history of, uh, of tin mining. So we have these ruins that dot the landscape all over, and, and you know, it's it's intense. You know, you'll see waves breaking up over these cliffs. It's big, massive, you know, pieces of rock and 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 heather and gorse, and it's it's a really a really primitive landscape in a country where there is no primitive landscape because it's been worked for thousands and thousands of years by the people that live there. So you have this really interesting blend of human interaction versus the wildness of nature that surrounds it. Um, so I, when I was designing these gates, it was just, it's, it's a really beautiful thing for me to be able to kind of just tune into my relationship with the landscape into which I was, you know, I had deep history. My family's from this part of the world for you know, generations. Um, and if that's interesting also for me here in Vancouver Island where I have zero deep connection to the landscape here. You know, I love it. I go out in the ocean and I surf and I, I, I appreciate where I live, but it's an appreciation, it's not a connection. Um, so designing these gates was just so it was really, really satisfying on this really personal level and this ability to express my appreciation for the environment that created me to create something for that environment. So, so these are the escape that I built based on, on, on this kind of landscape. Um, just playing with playing with plate and texture and, and heaviness and mass. Um, this is actually my favorite gate. I love this this thing. Um, with this, you know, the stacks of the of the mines, the massiveness of the material, simplistic forging. Um, you know, it's heavy in the material that it used, and it's you know, exp expressing the plasticity of the material, but also maintaining that that just that sense of immensity that, that, it, that it is surrounded by um what's the thickness of the plate that's oh made? that one's 10 mil plate so it's three eighths plate uh four feet tall and we forged this on a on a 500 weight massey up in edinburgh so jake did you sketch this first yeah yeah these these i drew out um because again you know in it's a gate it has to you know there's freedom in the design, but I also had has to fit between two fixed points. So yeah, these these were drawn out to scale and I drew them out full size on uh, on, on hardboard and built them to that. Obviously, I mean, I had quite a bit of freedom in, in the way the gate's constructed. If these pieces stretched out, you know, 20 mil wider, it's not gonna m matter too much because I can just overlap them further. But we, you know, we tried to stay pretty close to, to dimension as we were forging them. What were the hinges like on something this this heavy? That's a, it's a one inch pin epoxied into the ground there. So the hinges, the hinging system I use pretty much exclusively on my gates is a, is a strap hinge at the top. So there is a, there's a, there's a three quarter inch or one inch pin that is mounted between blocks to the gate. And then just a strap going around that that mounts back to a plate on the, on the wall. And in the bottom, I've just got a pin that is epoxied into the ground. It's got a little recessed top with a ball bearing that sits on top of it reese that up and swings like a charm and then you know, when you when you mount the gate you can uh, fix your top hinge and then you can adjust where this bottom pin goes um to the point where it's you know swinging swinging nicely and then drill the hole and drop it in what, what's the finish on this gate that's galvanized uh and then it is uh darkened with um tea wash which is uh I don't know, some very mild acid that essentially just takes the shine off the galv and then left and you know these this is this is you know a stone's throw from the atlantic ocean so it's going to take some serious abuse from the salt um 
So, yeah, they may not last all that long, but they look nice while they're alive. So I'm down with that. Um, and I did three gates to this house. They had three, three little entryways here. The second gate was based uh, very much on uh, part of this landscape that I love, which is the ocean. I'm, you know, I was almost born on a boat. Um, I've lived by the ocean my whole life, swim and surf, and I've, I've sailed. And, and you know, living down in Cornwall, the, the winter storms are pretty epic. You know, you'll have waves breaking over the three hundred foot cliffs. Um, it's it's intense, you know, but it's also continually moving absolutely living entity you know the ocean the ocean's about as alive as something you can get without having you know legs and lungs um and and immensely powerful and there's you know there's so much going on um and i wanted to capture this this idea of a wave breaking against the cliff and they, they had this one opening up against a, a big rock wall trying to capture that that sense of, of a wave breaking and the, you know the constant churning of the, the foam and the lip and the, the spray blowing in the wind um, and in terms of practicality on the gate, it was purely sculptural in so much as there was no need to keep anyone in or out. Um, dogs can jump through it. That's fine because this wall next to it's about two and a half feet tall. So dogs can jump over that. You know, there was, there was no issue for security here. Um, and it's quite three dimensional, this gate. So when it opens and as it swings, you get that, it, it's sort of curving in towards you, um, little spring latch on it. So self-closing. Real simple to operate. Um, yeah, I really like this one. I really like this one a lot. Um, all forged out of five eighths plate, pretty much. Um, so you know, good and chunky. Again, galvanized, patinaed. Um, yeah. And this one just not a strap hinge. I've actually got two pin hinges here. That one, um, it's just a, it's just a lift on hinge. But with the ball bearing in each one, again, swings really nicely. Um, the third gate I did for the property was based on on you know a scene that I witnessed countless times, which is of the, the sun breaking out behind a storm cloud. Which, if you've ever been to Cornwall, the west of England, is something you see a lot of. You see more storm cloud than sun, probably, but it's pretty spectacular when it goes off. Well, photography is all by my dad, by the way. Just takes lovely pictures of that area. Um, and you know, you get these, you get the sun rays and this. this ephemeral cloud, you know, sun appearing behind and the horizons and, and, and just the openness that you see, you know, looking out over, over a wide ocean. So this was my response to that. We've got some sunbeams and, and raindrops and, and the sun breaking through our horizon shape. And again, you know, no frame, um, relying on the, you know, the mass of the material to provide the structure. Building in joinery where it's useful, um, relied on, on welding here where I had these lap joints. I didn't want water getting in behind them, and there was not really any a rivet here would take away from the, the flow of the piece, whereas the joinery up here adds to it. Um, yeah, messing around with the hinges. Another, another nice little one. And I think that might bring us to the end of me talking about the work that I have done and might get us into talking about the work we're going to do. Um, anyone got anything they would like to say, ask, a pin, opine on, critique? Feel free to like, chime in with questions, people. I always like to hear a good critique. How heavy are some of these gates? Is that a problem in terms of finger pinches or, I mean, no, they seem because massive. Yeah, they're massive. Um, I mean, you theoretically have an issue. Say that big plate gate. You theoretically have an issue if someone was to get the wind core and have it slam in behind them. But mm, you would have to be, open enough that it don't think it would be pushed too much by the wind. Yeah. The, well, yeah. The big plate gate would, would catch it, but at the same time, it's uh, it's a small gate. It's not swinging a very great distance. Um, no, I find with I find with a hinging system where you have a, a movable bottom hinge, bottom pin, and a fixed top pin, you, you can you can um, you can angle your gate to be like finger push, easy open in both directions. You can kick that foot slightly this way, and it'll swing itself open and close itself. 
you know, you can kick it back a bit and throw it out of line and stiffen the hinges up a little bit. So you've got a, you've got a lot of ability to, to mess with the balance of the gate just by moving that bottom hinge a little bit. And if you don't have a frame in that opening and you haven't designed anything with, with straight lines, then you can move it off its true hanging position to, to give you that freedom of, of a controlling its swing and it's not going to affect how it looks in the opening. Like if you've designed a gate with a frame, Oh, it's got to hang absolutely 100% up and down. Otherwise, it'll look terrible. But if you've designed it all over the place and you know, jing, jingly jangly, like I designed my stuff, um, you've got a lot of freedom to, 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 to play with those little subtle, subtle lineups. So yeah, I don't, I, I don't massively factor weight into my design considerations unless I absolutely have to. Uh, very Jake, we very had a question, question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. on galvanizing. Yeah, I just lost it. All right, sorry. That's all right. My, my honest recommendation for galvanizing would be to send your work to England and have some good galvanizers dip it because so far I've discovered most galvanizers up here are absolute butchers. Certainly our local galvanizers are uh, interesting, to say the least. Oh, it says liking what the tea wash does to the galvan galvanize. I, yeah, it's really, really I, mis I misread that. I misread that. So, so the, 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 the equivalent that I found here that will give you a similar profile of, of the graying rather than blacking is conveniently called zinc gray and Scomp Nouveau sell it. So, and if, if it does go, you know, if you do a sample and it's too dark, you can dilute it back. And, and, and you know, the, the tea wash is, it's generally used as a, I think it's used often as a pre-paint finish. Like it'll, it'll give you that etch on a, on a galvanized. So if you want to paint it, it's given it, it's, you know, it's taken the shine off and given it a bit of tooth. Um, but if you just leave it by itself, it, go, it can go anywhere from a, a nice light gray to, a, to almost a, like a bronzy brown almost. Did you say that you wiped it on or sprayed it on? That was wiped on with a sponge. I, I left this. I left them out in the sun for an afternoon, and then just just wiped them on with a sponge. And I wasn't going for an absolutely uniform finish, you know. So, you know, I I let I let them. You know, if if I got some runs, I wasn't you know desperately trying to chase after the runs and even out the entire patina. But you, you can you can go for an absolute even finish. You know, just requires a bit more effort. Fucking around with the, the patinas. And when you took these pictures, mm -hmm. was it recent, like after you installed yeah, them, yeah. or were, had they been up there for a couple of years? Because it's, it's different colors. The, yeah, these ones had probably been up for at least a season or two. So there's, you know, there's there's a little bit of oxide still coming off. That's what the white yeah. is. Yeah, so it changes yeah, the, the yeah. tea wash or the the Sculpt Nouveau stuff. Oh. It, it'll eventually settle down and once it's gone through once it's gone through a few rinse cycles. It will it will you know. So I I. I, I, I what excuse me. I wipe it on, spray it on, depending on, on the application. Wait for it to go whatever color I'm hoping to get. And then just rinse it off. It's a water water that will neutralize it for the most part. And then hang it up there and, and it'll the base color doesn't change a huge amount, but you will get this, this sort of oxide fluff will come on it off it for a bit. But I think it's nice. I, I personally really I enjoy the fact that it's has a slightly slightly living patina for a while. And then yeah, once it's once it's fully stabilized, or if you really want to to really you know fix fix it, you could you know, rinse it right down and really really clean it up, and then just spray it with a with a clear coat, and it'll be bomber after that. All right. Is that it? That's all the questions. Well, let's get into conference stuff. All right, let's do it. Uh, so that would be even just the next slide. Oh no, oh no, there's there's just a photo of like sexy, I don't really. It's just, oh, oh yeah. Uh, it's that it's just forging. That's what we love to do, or it's what I love to do. Mm. Um, mm. I don't have anything to say about this. Love it. Other than, other than I just really like it. Yeah. It, yeah. Agreed. Here we are, conference. 
Um, so this is coming up this April in Vista. Um, it's going to be a collaborative piece. It's going to be, wow, I mean, it's sort of life-size based on the fact that this mythical creature doesn't actually exist, but we can assume that he's probably going to stand around six feet tall if he was, if he was standing. Um, so it'll probably hang. It'll be similar, similar to the, the, the fallen angel in, in, our, um, in Adam's forge. It'll probably be about four feet tall, I would think, and six feet wide when we're done. Um, and the sculpture is called Not All. What did I call this? What did I call this one? Not All Lights Will Lead Safely Home. Is that what I called it? I can't remember. That was the general gist of it. So it is a, it is a demon. Hanging, he's going to be hanging actually on, I think, a signpost in Vista. And he is holding a lantern yeah. out to uh, to lead the to lead the unwary down the down the path. And um, my take on what that lantern represents is entirely mine, and what anyone else may wish to put in that lantern as the uh, as the lure a demon may cast can be their own interpretation. Um, which I think is a well nice said. way to leave the sculpture. Um, I like that. Uh, well said. And yeah, with um, this, it, it's, yeah, it's, it'll be a collaborative. I don't actually know who's on the team at the moment, but I, I'm imagining we'll be pulling people off the bleachers every now and again. I know that all the Reno Forge boys are coming down, so we've got some heavy hitters. Up. Um, so so uh, I'm there, Josh Bueller. <laughs> Uh, I'm hoping to, yeah. I know he's Heather's a mighty force. Isn't it? Heather, yes. Um, hopefully, John Barron can make it. Uh, I believe Zach uh, or Zeke. Shoot. Yeah. And then another guy named Reed, I believe. Um, and I, I'm sure John, uh, Dave Carroll could. Mm -hmm double check my my memory but i think that's what we got so far plus a lot how of am i doing on. dave i'm going to really encourage my team to at least take you know a four hour shift one day and have everybody go in and and swing yeah. ahead more, more so the merrier it's, it's all good so as long as i can as long as i can keep the circus faintly under control we'll all be good but um you know this one so we're going to you know it's going to be a real blend of uh like the the body uh, going down to kind of you know where where the where the spine is kind of kicking into the pelvis there, going up to the shoulders, the brace for the neck. That's going to be a single piece. That's going to, we're going to do that out of plate. So we'll pre-cut a shape um, out of something mm, half inch, half or five eighths. It's going to allow us to uh, to really get in some heavy edge work, and then use the you know the distortion of the edges and. and pushing pushing that material around into a more three-dimensional shape so you know there'll be some you know some pretty big material there but you know some really fun sledgehammer work um wings are going to be created out of multiple pieces i was thinking about doing them like this shown in the drawing all fire welded um branch weld them together but i, th I think we'll do them more like the wings on the on the fallen angel where we take uh take take the feathers individually and forge them out that way i can keep more people forging more of the time uh, rather than tying everyone up into it. Like you know, if you take that wing and do it as a branch weld, it suddenly becomes a two, two person operation to make a large piece of sculpture. Whereas I could have, you know, six people on it and, and, and bring it all together at the end, which is uh, I think a little more entertaining. Um, the arms will be forged from a single piece. The hands will be forged from a separate piece and we'll fire weld those on. The head, be different to that because it's too big of a chunk to try to be bothering to forge so i will modify the the weight of the head a little bit um or add another layer of joinery in there so we can create you know, a solid head but not have to forge a big old piece of plate around into a really awkward shape like that um, and the lantern the lantern will be a three-dimensional lantern uh i haven't given any thought to being able to put a light in it um but we'll certainly make it that you can bonk a candle into it um, it's fun. Um, yeah, I, I think I want to leave. I'm, I'm not going to tell anyone. You could probably guess from my you know, general leanings and previous sculptures what I think the lantern might represent, but I think it could be very personal to whoever wants to look at that. Um, the idea is, you know, we are drawn like moths to the flame, and 
sometimes we have to be careful of what flames we choose to follow. Uh, I think it is, it's a piece that will, that's a timeless it's moral. It's a great it's also, piece. It's also of its time. So, um, and the demon, you know, he's a, he's a devil, but he also looks like he might be quite good fun, doesn't he? Hanging out on a lamppost. Kind of want to party with that guy too. So, you know, it's not all bad. Yeah, we all have a little little bit in them. So. Yeah. Do you think yeah, the wing... I, I, I'm excited to work on this mm -hmm. with yeah, you. Me too. Yeah, me too. So, me be nice to the get the band back the, together. The arms and the wing material will be starting with square stock or round stock or more plate? Uh, no, the, the arms will be flat bar. I'm thinking the arms will probably be by half and then you know we'll forge we'll forge that uh, pointing with my finger but you can't see my finger so i'll turn oh geez well <laughs> we'll take we'll, we'll you know we'll forge the we'll forge the arms from the central knuckle where we'll get some you know we'll get in there with some heavy fuller work and we'll, we'll drag those edges up and really thicken this out and get some ball tool in here to really put some texture in you know then we pull those away let them thicken up a bit as we come out punch that hole in behind the shoulder there, scarf that up for a firewall. Um, so that would be that arm section. Uh, the wings will probably be more flat bar. Um, it just, it'll give us an ability to create sort of some volume in the, in the feathers without coming too heavy. Uh, legs, this, this, the, the, the thighs will be a single piece and each leg will be Probably two pieces again with a fire weld in around the shin area. Um, probably flat bar again, um, just because of the, the way the sculpture shifts. If we were trying to do that in square in the time we have, I think we would be flailing a little hard. This tenon, heel tenon here, where it goes through the pelvis, this will again probably be either lap joined and riveted or scarfed onto the bottom of that. Um, and then riveted, riveted through with a, with a big heel tenon. So there's, there's there's a lot going on, and you know it'll be it'll be technically I think pretty challenging. Um, it should keep us pretty busy, but it'll be a whole lot of fun, you know. And then we get to hang out on that on that signpost, and this is pretty yeah. So I'm looking see. forward to it. Yeah, yeah, it's gonna be good. And here endeth the lesson. No, there you go. That's me. Awesome. Hey, Jake, we've well, got a couple of questions. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Bring them on. Uh, back to the the thing that I admitted, and, and Glenn's going to... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Glenn Gilmore has a question about that. Um, so when you fuller the straight bar into the circle, mm -hmm. do you have a top and bottom spring fuller uh, going it, on? It, or it, is it... It, uh, it depends. It depends on 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 what I'm forging and how it's going to be viewed. So the the lamp the lamps that went on the wall were forged all from one side. Um, just using a top fuller. The bench was forged from both sides, and that very first sculpture, the 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 very the second slide, that's forged from both sides. Using using, and I used I don't if I'm doing if I'm forging from both sides, I won't use spring fillers. They're too, they're too clickety clackety. They just, they bounce all over the place. Really hard to control them. Um, so I will fix fillers to the top and bottom dies on my hammers. Or right. if you do, and you could do it with a press. Um, but it, I, I feel it is more of a responsive forging, more suited to doing under a hammer. Um, you could probably achieve it with a press, but it's going to look way more, way more rigid, way less fluid if you. If you Really? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Hmm. Just because the way you know the way the material moves, the unevenness of each hit and the bounce, and all of those little subtle micro yeah. micro imperfections that you get that you get forging the shape like that under the hammer. Sure. You know, a press is so much more deliberate. You're going to create a really dramatic shape, but dramatic for a different way. Right. It would it would it will express the it'll express the fact that the material has been moved in that way, but it it would be for what I'm trying to achieve, it would be something less because, it, because those imperfections would not be telling that story subconsciously to the viewer of the piece of how this thing is you know, grown and moved like that. Yeah, I get that. I get that. 
for sure. Not to say that it wouldn't look epic done under a press out some really heavy material, but it would be a sure. different, different flavor. You know? It would. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. A little more, uh, not machined, but uh, maybe possibly even evened out. Or just, something. just more deliberate. You know. I, yes. I just it would just change how you read the piece, um, but the fixed tooling is really essential. Yeah, spring, so what spring. determines you when you want to use just a top or or both the top and bottom? Uh, I guess it's the three dimensionality of the piece. You know, if it's a piece that's going to be out and you can walk around it, then I'm going to use I'm going to use top and bottom tools. If it's a wall piece, I'll be much happier to use a top tool. Um, I use a lot of top tools on three-dimensional pieces and just rely on the fact that you're pushing the material so hard in a peculiar dimension on the hammer that the, 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 you know, just the palette, the bottom palette of the hammer is imparting its own, its own texture. And sometimes I'll take a big, a big bottom fuller and I'll put a hand, you know, it gets a little risky because the, the chance of coming off center increases quite dramatically, but you know, I'll, I'll put a curve, you know, a broad bottom fuller and then I'll a narrow handheld top fuller and I'll work the material like that. Um, and then yeah, it just means you're not always getting a flat on the back of what you're hitting, right? That would be, but you got you have to just be a little more careful that you don't get carried yeah. away and, and walk off the edge of that die and flip the thing around, right? Is it ever the thickness of what you're starting with of the stock? Sure. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. We have another question. Uh, what's the thickness of the material, uh, or what thickness material are you going to be starting with for, oh, was it for the piece in the, for the conference? Yeah. I think you kind of talked about that yeah. mostly. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Sorry. Not, not super heavy, but you know, heavy enough that well, yeah, we'll, we'll have a work cut out for us. We, I heard a lot a of half comment, inch. We have a comment yeah. that the lamp could be a solar cell in any color that could be in the, could fit into the lamp, a solar piece that would be constantly recharging. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it would have to figure out a way to, uh, to, to get a solar charger working. But yeah, we could, we could toy um, with that. Uh, Jake, if you want to stop your share, we can get everybody's oh, uh, sure. faces okay. back yeah, up yeah, here. Yeah. And, uh, now I want to hog the screen uh, just for myself. Everybody feel free to uh, turn on your cameras and your mics and uh, uh, jump in and ask questions and responses and song. Well, there's a whole lot of stage people. Great. Really uh, great stuff you're doing. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have a lot of fun doing it. I think is I think that's the important thing, right? How yeah, big are some of these it, rivets? It, it's at the end of the day. Yeah. Someone was just about ahead, to ask Michael. about someone was about to ask about riveting. Uh, how big are the rivets oh, that you're using in most of these in these larger life size sculptures? Oh half uh, inch to quarter? It depends. Sometimes one inch. I think the on that on the first touch sculpture, I think the the shoulder rivets. I think we use one inch. We've got a big squishy head on them, but yeah, I mean, whatever kind of just whatever suits the design, right? I'm not gonna I'm not gonna fix a rivet size and say that's what I'm gonna use. Yeah. Do you have uh, any recommendations of things to play around with or things to try out for um, people practicing uh, more abstract work? Most of my stuff is very representational mm. and I'm working on improving my abstract designs. Well, it's going to depend on what you are forging with, whether you're forging with a hand hammer or if you've got access to, to any kind of equipment you can forge with, that's going to dictate some of the way you can move the material. I think there's a rapidity to the movement that you generate using power equipment that is hard to achieve with a hand hammer. But um, I don't know, I think Take take a shape that you that you just really respond well to. 
you know, whether it's a shape someone else has created in steel or something that you can bring in as an external influence and, and just, just go to town on that, you know, stay really focused on, on that shape and, and explorations of just little things, how, how you hit it, the difference that it makes, you know, like forging those, those circles. You know, I've done lots of them. There's lots of different ways that they can go and they can go horribly wrong. You know, if, if you get, you know, three hits in the wrong place and you've got to toss that piece in the scrap and grab another one because you've, you've gone too thin or you've chopped through it or you've put a pinch in it or, you know, you've lost your definition. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't have any, I don't think I have a recommendation of any exercises to do. Um, just, yeah, just, just, find the shape don't be afraid to fail i think that's really important um and also accept that if you are going to achieve one thing it's often in that time that you find the thing that you actually kicks you off like that that little lady sculpture the saharan queen sculpture for me was a complete happy accident you know i i was not intending to make a figurative sculpture and it you know radically altered how i approached forging steel from that point on so um you know, be be open, be open to the accidents. Um, Richard, the guy I trained with, he he always used to say that uh, there are no mistakes, only opportunities. You know, so you know, don't get discouraged if something doesn't turn out like you want it to, because it may turn out way better than you were expecting. If you can you know, keep that keep that spark of openness in your mind when you're looking at it. Ask me up. Get it, Please. but keep. keep when when you and when you're wanting to play with anything plastic, heat is your friend. Absolutely. That's that's important. Um, you know, keep it. You lose definition in in working really hot material, but if you're trying to kind of generate shapes, mucking around on cold materials is just a waste of time. Yeah, you just cannot generate that movement on the material that's resisting so hard. So get it screaming hot. Hey, well, thanks for a great. Um presentation and enjoy listening and seeing your slides and look forward to seeing you again yeah absolutely absolutely well thank you thank you for having me thanks for uh, thanks for tuning in for a whole two hours so you know i applaud your patience <laughs> thanks for being there my pleasure my pleasure yeah look forward yeah, to it, it's kind of Man. nice to see you see my other friends i i'm really looking forward to actually yeah i mean i i think the the thing i did at center for metal arts was like yeah it's the first one in ages you know, man, it'd be nice to see people actually touch each other and you know stuff yeah. breathe on each other <laughs> and like, weird right i uh, really looking forward to it right looking forward well, this was you, amazing you got a good team Yeah, I'm excited for it. Yeah. I'm excited to. Uh, I'm excited right. to see. Thank you. See thank the team you. Come yeah. together. Thank and, you. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully, see you all at the conference. See you in April. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Awesome, Jake. Fantastic. Hey, everybody all in right. here. Nice collection of slides. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Michael, for. Yeah, organizing. For, uh, yeah, thank you very much for that. Yeah, Excellent. this has been fun. Yeah. It was great Thank you, see. Michael. I mean, backbone here. Um, we'll yeah. make the uh, yes. recording available so. of this um, sometime in the next couple of weeks, certainly before spring conference comes around. Um, uh, it's taken a little bit to get them loaded up to the YouTube and get them edited, but uh, uh, we'll let everybody sign up for the class, know what the link is going to be. And I'll turn off the recording, actually. I know.